Hello, I'm Michael Cusimano. I'm a professor uh, at the MIT Sloan School of Management and also in the MIT Engineering Systems Division. Well, I, I, there is a lot of hype around it, but uh, we've had technological entrepreneurship for decades and in some ways even centuries. So there really is nothing new about technology-based entrepreneurship. That's how the Industrial Revolution started with manufacturing. Uh, but we've seen it with telecommunications, railroads, all sorts of technologies. So it is not new. What is new is the internet and computers software have made starting companies much easier than it used to be and also advertising your product or your service much easier so that's new and that's where i think a lot of the hype is what i have been writing about increasingly the last uh, 10 years or so is the role of services um, services of many many different types but if I have to look back at the last couple hundred years and talk about how has technology development or innovation changed the structure of the economy, the first big change was a, sh was a shift from labor in agriculture to labor in manufacturing, making physical products of some sort. But the big trend uh, among all advanced economies is a shift of labor out of manufacturing and into services. And that takes up about 70 to 80 percent of all uh, employment in advanced economies like the United States. So if you think about how has technology impacted the economy and labor, it's, it's impacted the structure of, of where money comes from, where, uh, where sources of productivity and gains are, and again, first for manufacturing, then um, well, agriculture to manufacturing and then to services. So a big area today is to figure out how to make services more productive um, rather than labor intensive. So again, we see a lot of innovation in software tools, automated services, uh, for example, taking, uh, uh, you know, buying and selling of stocks or banking operations or airlines and taking that away from people doing it that you hire to, to providing tools, internet-based software tools for people to do that work themselves. And this is all around innovation and services. And we have many more of these kinds of startup companies coming up. You know, Airbnb, for example, or Uber, which are providing services in sharing the economy of rooms or taxi services. So there's a lot of things going on. Most of them I put in the bucket of services in one form or another. I think history says, uh, tells us that uh, technological innovation is a democratizing force in the sense that um, technological innovation makes products and services cheaper and more available to a larger percentage of the population. We also see innovation creating employment opportunities and more than just uh, menial or very trivial agricultural labor kinds of opportunities. Even in agriculture, you have a lot of employment that was created not in agriculture, but in manufacturing, but to service agriculture. Companies like John Deere or Caterpillar or Sony in China, uh, these are huge companies employing hundreds of thousands of people that make agricultural equipment, machinery, right? And then lots of software and services associated with those companies. Um, so, so innovation not only makes products and services more available to the masses, it creates employment opportunities, higher value added employment opportunities. Um, so it's, it's definitely a democratizing factor. Um, at the same time, I think from history we also know that there's um, transition periods. So if you mechanize labor in agriculture, you're going to put a lot of farmers out of work, at least temporarily. So that's also happened in every country around the world. And same thing with services. If you mechanize uh, stock trading on the internet, you put brokers out of work. And, um, 
or travel advisors out of work. So there's a transition period and in that sense uh, innovation creates disruption but in the long run uh, it leads to much greater wealth for every society where we've seen innovation. So you have to be patient, you have to be educated. Education is critical because the more education you have, the more flexible you are to adapt and learn new things. Um, so in the long run, there's no question it's a forward moving force. Well, we don't actually keep a list and I've taught a couple thousand students in the 28 years I've been here. But um, I think most recently what comes to mind is um, uh, a company called HubSpot that was uh, started by two students who were in my class, um, which is now called Software and Internet Entrepreneurship. Um, and HubSpot uh, has raised about, I don't know, about $100 million in venture capital. It's kind of, kind of big and it's going public sometime this year and they it's like a salesforce.com but for marketing tools for the internet so they target small and medium-sized companies with tools to help them optimize their websites to try to reach the right customers and then analyze customers who come to their website by making them answer questions and forms and then to qualify leads and then they provide tools to help customers um, use the web more effectively to write web papers, uh, I mean white papers off for the web or Twitter feeds, uh, Facebook pages, things to help market their company. So they're, they're, that's one company we're quite proud of and there have been a lot of others. Most of the others have been in software of different types, security software or different kinds of enterprise software. Another one was a battery company which uh, uh, raised uh, I think about a billion dollars and had a huge IPO and then went uh, unfortunately went bankrupt and was sold to the Chinese but uh, it's still part of the innovation network well 10 years and 20 years are quite different but um, um, Certainly the biggest impact we've had in the last, in the past 10 or 20 years has been first, first the internet for communications and then uh, cell phones and uh, the increasing f functionality and capabilities on cell phones, what we call smartphones today. So clearly I think 10 years from now all cell phones will be smart devices and that they will, they will be computers, fully functional, on the web, accessing uh, everything that's available to anyone with a computer on the web. question will be, you know, how much uh, Wi-Fi access will there be right now uh, in a lot of developing countries. We, we don't have uh, Wi-Fi access in, say, rural communities. And, but I think uh, 10 years from now, probably every village in the world will have some kind of internet and Wi-Fi connection and 20 years from now absolutely that'll be true. We also know that the internet can be a lot faster than it actually is right now and uh, it could be a hundred times, it could be a thousand times faster and that's kind of a miracle of software and hardware but 20 years from now we will have blazingly fast internet connections through ubiquitous Wi-Fi probably WiMAX or, wire, or wireless mesh kinds of networks. Um, and that will enable communication and access to services and products over the web that were education over the web um, and advertising. And uh, that is, we can imagine it today because we see pockets of it, but uh, it will be an everyday occurrence then. And uh, we'll also see use of that network in ways that we're just imagining now. Um, sensors on our clothing or things like Google Glasses and a lot of companies now have smart wristwatches but there will be devices that will be monitoring our health care, personal identity, health care records, uh, financial records. So almost everything will be connected, cloud storage based, 
and um, at least in a communications way. These are um, advances that will require quite open access to information and um, so there's also a danger that there will be um, um, security risks with this kind of information. So you may, may very well see some societies shutting down or putting walls up around these kinds of innovations. Uh, and we also don't know how some countries around the world will respond. Countries that are not democratic countries, whether it's China, for example, or uh, Middle Eastern countries or others that are run by religious groups. So there's going to be a lot of potential for changes in our lifestyle, but um, in, from the, in the technology, but we'll see, uh, you know, not every society will react the same way. Those of us that study technological innovation for and, and economists who look at this, for decades, we've always broken it down into different categories. So some technology helps existing companies and makes them more efficient. Um, other technology replaces existing businesses and products and services, and, and that's very disruptive. So technology does both. It enhances and it disrupts. And, both are part of economic growth, and you need both. So, you know, there's no reason to use 300 people to build an automobile if you can design robots and then build the automobile with five people and do it in two hours instead of 20 days, right? So, um, you know, it's disruptive on, that kind of innovation is disruptive on some level to companies that were labor intensive but um, most companies that will survive, and I've written a lot about this, particularly in, in the last book I did, and I'll plug my book, it's called Staying Power, and it's, it's really about this kind of thing, but flexibility is really important to companies uh, if they're going to stay around for a long period of time. So it's, don't look at disruptions as being or technological disruptions as putting you out of business, but figure out as a manager an or an entrepreneur how you can take advantage of these innovations to change your business or change your business model, but in a good way. So, you know, we take the disruptions with the improvements when it comes to technology. We've had the internet becoming increasingly available. And so that period, mid 19, you know, 1994, 95 to the mid 2000s was, a, was really a period of the internet. And then uh, that created an enormous boom in investment and in any kind of company connected with the internet or technology infrastructure. And then we had a collapse of that market, of that bubble. Um, and that had a lot of impact. So I think the past decade, from roughly the mid 2000s to the present, we've been adjusting to the collapse of the internet bubble, the search for more stable or sustainable business models connected with internet technology. At the same time, we've seen an explosion of mobile devices, an explosion of new kinds of software applications and again, mostly accessible through mobile devices. Um, so, so I think those have been the real changes, this um, concern about business models and staying away from bubbles, but also wanting to take advantage of trends that move very fast, like wireless and internet-based uh, uh, smartphone apps, things like that anything cloud-based, which is really services coming off the internet. So there's a lot of things that are different in the past 10 years than the 10 years before that or 10 years before that. The worst part of technology is that um, we spread information or capabilities to do bad things. And uh, whether it's nuclear bombs or whether it's 
hacking social security numbers or credit card numbers of a billion people around the world every year, which basically happened last year. I mean, so, and this is all enabled by technology, right? So, uh, and then we have, uh, you know, the potential for bioterrorism too. Um, but I guess what would worry me most as being a software person uh, for the most part is just all the criminal conduct that goes on with the internet. And the internet is is best used as an open system. And, when, and if you start having to put up walls and complex cryptography, and it just puts up a lot of barriers to the free flow of information and access to information, where, which is useful to a lot of innovation. So I worry a lot about you know, criminal activity on the internet, and which are threats to all of our security. It's hard to be a teacher and not be an optimist, right? If we, if we, if I believe the future would be worse than the present or the past, um, um, it would be very difficult to teach. So, um, but um, I think I'm kind of a realist. Uh, but I, I think we've seen wonderful improvements in technology over the past 150 years. I was trained initially as a historian so i've studied ancient greek science and as well as uh, medieval science industrial revolution as well as modern 20th century 21st century technology and the software business and software engineering so um, there's no doubt that um, technological progress has made uh, our lives uh, the, or the lives of most people on the planet uh, uh, a lot better than they used to be. But we still need to remember that uh, even in the United States, we have maybe a third of the population that is not so well off, and some people living in third world country conditions. We have a lot of people in other parts of the world that are not doing well. We have a lot of societies that have principles for controlling their societies that I just can't understand. One would like to think, and I think we have thought of this in the past, that uh, there is a common language amongst you know, engineers and scientists which can give us a common ground to thinking about, okay, what is best for society and progress based on technology and science. Uh, but unfortunately, um, lots of other ideas interfere, and that is something I worry about. There's no question that we see a lot of innovation capabilities and investment and tremendous training in science and engineering going on in these different Asian countries. Um, but I do think there is something lacking in these countries and that is, um, I guess, the structure of education and, and the process of it. So in America, we have, in the United States, we. We have a bit more of a chaotic educational system. It's not centrally controlled. It's really different at each local level. And families have a great deal of influence over what you study and where you study. So it's, um, and we also have multiple paths. No one tracks you onto a technology or engineering or math science track too early in life. And, um, you could be a college graduate in, in English literature and then decide you want to go to medical school. And it's possible to do that in this country if you're smart enough and take the time to re-educate yourself. So all this kind of uh, multiple paths and lack of standardization and some creative chaos that we have in the United States really ends up being a tremendous advantage when it comes to innovation. Um, and that's that process um, and some other elements uh, have really led to us having um, just wonderful universities like MIT, MIT, Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley, and a couple